Okay, everybody. I want to welcome everybody to uh, With Insights Radio. I'm your host, Iggy Garcia. Uh, we're doing a pre-recorded show here. Uh, today, I'm with the founder of InSpirit Arts Vending Academy, or Vendor Academy, I believe that's the exact wording on that. Um, her name is Sylvia Nespa. How do you say that? Nebs- oh, it's Nespa. It's phonetic. N-E-B-S-A. Neb. So I'm Neb- sorry, there are not very many English names that start with N-E-B. I like so. that. I like that. <laughs> so we just call her Miss Nepsa, right? That's, That's what people call me, Miss right. Nepsa. Mm-hmm. Some of you are probably familiar with uh, Miss Nepsa. She does a lot of uh, shows here in Columbus, Ohio, in Cincinnati, you know, kind of just about everywhere in different regions and in, in the locations. But um, she's a founder of this um, organization that we're going to be talking about today. <clears throat> it's called uh, In Spirit Arts Vendor Academy which is an academy that is designed to help vendors to uh, find their, their inner vending spirit, I guess is the best way to call it, <laughs> you know, because so many of them work hard and they struggle and they, they try to do, you know, what everybody does. They show up, they get there, they hope that someone's going to walk by their booth and buy their products. Um, I know you've been doing this for almost over 30 some plus years in developing um, just this program, just by sheer example or j- just by doing it. And eventually at some point from conversations with you, you just decided, well, you know what? People need help. I need help because uh, you have a mag- magnetism. Your personality is like a magnet. I know that for a fact. I walked into your booth and I think I went out with three or four head, head wraps, which I'm wearing today. <laughs> yeah, when it wasn't pressure, you know, it was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. You, you kind of looked, showed me the colors and things that you thought would look good on me versus maybe what I like because I'm maybe, you know, some guys just, we don't get it right sometimes. Right. You get stuck in a rut. We call that the fashion rut. (laughs) I want blue. I want blue. Only blue. No. (laughs) But uh, anyhow, I would like to welcome you to uh, our show into this interview and um, I hope you're having a great day. Well, thank you, Iggy. But you know, your, your followers in the Ohio region, they might have seen me on the vendor circuit, but none of them will recognize me because I'm not wearing a head wrap. That's so true. I'm going to take care of that right now. What I've got here is a hand-woven scarf. And if you can see, it's got gaps in the threads. Okay. I don't know if you can see that. I do see that. And that's okay. really important because it okay. makes it so that the air goes through. Oh, wait, I should be showing the camera. There you yeah, go. Yeah, I, I never, You never noticed that. Yeah. And so the air goes through and it makes it more lightweight. It also makes it so they don't slip and slide. So these okay. scarves are hand woven by women's co-ops in Central America. And it's really important because they um, depend on me and us to distribute them in America mm-hmm. so they can um, preserve the art of weaving the way they've been doing for so long. So I'm going to start shoulder width. I'm going to gather this scarf. You can see I'm going to pinch it. Maybe I'm too far away. Let me see. When she closed rather, I'm going to pinch it mm-hmm. and create these little pleats. But at the bottom, I leave it flat. And the flat part is what I want to put along my hairline. So okay. I'm going to put that around. I'm just going to leave the microphone where it is. And I crisscross on top. Obviously, there's nowhere else to go. Right. Now, I have a choice here. I could just bring it around and tuck it. Or I could make it a little fancier by flipping it back. Nice. And then flipping it. And that gives it a little bit more patterning that people like. And then here in the back, let me turn around. Oops, I can't turn around because of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just visualize it, you know, in the back. Yeah, more I guess you're just going to have to imagine what I'm doing. I'm tucking it from the top down. So there you go. I'm tucking it and I'm rolling it in. Because the whole thing about wrapping your hair is that it should be a perfect fit every time. Nice. That looks great. Oh, thank you. Now you now you have something to keep your microphone from falling off your head. <laughs> yeah, your to keep my brains inside. Never <laughs> <scared of> brain. <laughs> People like the way they feel. It's like a head hug. So that's sure. usually the first thing. So um, in Spirit Arts, you said something about my magnetism. Yes. And it's very interesting because we discovered that um, we discovered a turnkey method after years of practicing and working with different people so that everybody gets the same results. You don't have to have a magnetism. You just have to be able to say the script and 
present the actions and do what you know the turnkey method requires awesome. and because the reason why it, uh, it it creates such a nice experience for people is that we take all the attention away from the salesperson onto the shopper and we just mm -hmm. dote on them so after a while the shopper totally forgets that we're even there because they're so focused on themselves and the colors and the right, styles right. and therefore you know that's how we create this what we call it a memorable shopping experience very good that's that's what i had yeah <laughs> people generally remember for a long time whenever good, they dealt yeah. with us yeah well, miss nepso let's 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 go backtrack a little bit let's go back in time just, just a little bit we don't need to go too far back but um take us back a little bit how you actually got started on on this great adventure you call it head wrapping and bandanas and just hats and it evolved into a whole bunch of cool stuff. And I, I think that our listeners would actually would like to hear that because that kind of gives a foundation of who you are and what you mean to this program. Okay. I'm going to try to make it fast, but sure. you know, short stories is not my, is not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in Africa for a long time. So I learned how to tell long drawn out stories. Sorry, I hurt myself on my light. I thought someone threw someone at you. No, it was a light bulb. I hit my hand on it. <laughs> All right. Anyways, um, I've always been involved in crafts, and I, you might find it strange, but I started my first craft school when I was only three years old in the basement oh, wow. of our house. My sister was a marketer. She recruited the, the neighborhood kids, and um, I taught them how to make crafts, you know, decorating bottles and simple things. And so um, I, I learned a lot of crafts over the years. My parents sent me to classes, and I got hooked on vending thanks to my weaving teacher. I was probably about 10 or 11 years old, and she let me sit in her the corner of her booth at the Ann Arbor Street Fair, mm -hmm. which is a huge event. And so I got my first taste of vending sitting with her. And um, uh, when we moved to Africa, I was 16 years old, and, you know, in Africa, you, you come face to face with extreme poverty. And so when I graduated from high school and went to France for university, I couldn't forget, um, you know, my calling was to do something, especially hunger. The hunger issue in Africa was very disturbing to me. Mm -hmm. And um, but being uh, somebody who loved vending, I spent a lot of time in markets hanging out with vendors during my travels. And I went to Greece and I learned a lot from a certain vendor that was at the bottom of the Acropolis. And in the south of France, vending and any type of retail fashion is taken very seriously. It's not like here. It's like in America, retail are sometimes the bottom of the rank concerning or the rung concerning like, occupations. But in France, it's considered a privilege to dress people up. Mm -hmm. So I picked up these attitudes and um, uh, just loving markets and in Africa, always shopping in a market. And then when I came back to America at the age of 35 years old, well, let me back up a little bit. So um, when I was in Africa, I left France and I came back to Africa to work with crafts because I saw that as the answer to work with um, very undereducated, underprivileged women who had skills using their hands, not just women, but women and men. So I was in uh, different organizations to raise money for different causes. And so my idea was to work with these artisans and to um, uh, help them develop their craft in a way that would be more marketable, the right sizes and colors and shapes. And then take these things to the women's groups who would sell them outside of um, supermarkets and at the malls. So that was my first introduction to just selling off of one table. And so my job was to train these women how to do it. So that's when I first started thinking hard about how to teach other people the art of vending. How do you get people to stop and even look at your products? I mean, you mentioned before, a lot of vendors just put up a beautiful display and they just wait and hope that people will notice them. But mm -hmm. that's not a good way to make a living. You can't predict any income that way. So if you have techniques for getting people to draw them to the table and to get them interested, to get them engaged, you can make um, sales one after another after another all day long. It doesn't matter if they're a thousand people there or a hundred people there. You can just keep that thing flowing. So that's when I first started uh, teaching mm -hmm. vending. And that was way back in, um, when I started in 1982. In Spirit mm -hmm. Arts started in 1982. 
So um, a lot of things happened, very exciting things. Uh, when I ended up starting a movement, a crafting movement with rolled paper jewelry, I won't go too much into that, but by the time I left Africa, I'd had a really strong sense of what it felt like to work with um, or to create opportunities for people that spread far and wide, far beyond my reach. And, you know, the movement took a life of its own. So when I came back to America, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could start a movement in America? Mm -hmm. And um, as a vendor, um, I was basically a student. When I came back here, I wanted to be a student. So I would use vending as a way to finance my summer travels. I'd go to different countries, source out products, and bring them back, and also make some things myself. But mostly working with village co-ops, because my um, emphasis has always been to help them to distribute. And um, so as, as fate would have it, um, people were always commenting on my hair scarves. Okay. And people were constantly asking me, you know, how did I do it? How do I tie them? And I realized that, you know, learning to tie a hair scarf is not that obvious. Even in Africa, I would have to like corner a priestess in the bathroom of a gas station and force her to show me. <laughs> well, <laughs> so easy. <laughs> you just you will I'm teach like, me. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and so, because um, it can be a little bit competitive, you know. Really? Like, oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They don't give up their secrets so easily. So um, I just decided to incorporate head wrapping into my vending booth and as a student and as over time the head wrapping and the headbands and the hats just took over the whole operation wow. and I uh, developed a method for teaching people in you know giving people little two minute tutorials how to tie their scarves in a variety of different ways most of the styles are very simple you see this is very simple it's yeah. basically a glorified headband and we keep them simple because we're teachers, they're beginners, you know. And I do have meetup groups where we do more elaborate style wrapping, but I have no um, intention to intimidate my customers. I want them to have fun, and I teach them things that they can easily do by themselves. Now, is that wrap, is that just strictly a woman's wrap that you're wearing? Uh, the way I tied it is kind of womanish because of the okay. turban effect in the middle. I see. But when I go to, like, powwows and I tie the Native Americans – if I'm working with South American men, I do a completely different style. Nice. So right. that's part, one of your hashtags is wrap our world. Yes. Right. Wrap our world. <laughs> and village to vendor pipeline. Yes. That's what we call it. The vendor to village pipeline. Because, um, well, what happened is that I went on to Facebook after wrapping a while. And I knew, I mean, I knew in the mid 90s that I would end up writing a book about uh, vending. And uh, because I've been focused on it my whole life, <laughs> and I know a lot about vending that most people don't even think about. And then when I came to America, I discovered that, wow, the vending situation here was pretty dismal because, um, well, America is a uh, store culture. Okay. It's not a culture where people think about the open market. And so what you get is when people start their vending businesses, they end up imitating store clerks. And that could be bad. Well, it's the exact opposite of being a good vendor. <laughs> yeah. A store and a vending booth, the approaches are, they couldn't be further apart. I know. I've been to some stores and they kind of ignore you sometimes. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. They, I'm like, go home. <laughs> I want to buy something. <laughs> well, that's the whole thing. Store clerks are not trained to be um, very helpful generally. They just sit there and take the money. So the concept in the store is that you just put up a beautiful display, and then people pick what they want, and they browse around, and they carry it up to the cash register. It's generally like that. Well, if you run a booth like that, mm -hmm. um, you won't be able to pay your bills. Um, people have a different mentality when they're going to an open-air market. Um, first of all, they're just walking by. Every 10 feet, there's a whole new um, display. So you have to get your display to stand out. And it's not really the visual, it's the audio. You have to say things that cause people to be curious enough to turn their head and walk over. Because you know example, people are, they have momentum. For example, what, that, what would that be? I walked by oh, those are the tips and tricks of the trade. Ooh, here I we go. 
<laughs> if I were to divulge that here now, nobody would sign up for my free that's newsletter. Right. And, and that's why we're here to promote you and, and, and have you share your beautiful knowledge with us. So keep, continue. Tell us a little bit more. Sure. So I do have a newsletter called Tips and Tricks of the Trade, and um, it's a discussion piece. It's a slideshow. I try to make it interesting because people don't like reading. (laughs) So it's a slideshow, weekly slideshow that we discuss in my um, Facebook group. The -hmm. Facebook group is called In Spirit Arts Academy. Um, Facebook.com slash groups, or you just look up In Spirit Arts Academy. And um, you'll find us there. So um, at Inspired Arts Academy, well, let me back up a little bit. So okay. when I, yeah, it was in, um, I can't remember, about five or six years ago, uh, I had the impulse to open, uh, start a Facebook group. And I thought that I could put together or, you know, call together all the different people that I found on the internet all around the world who were doing head wrapping demonstrations mm-hmm. and head wrapping workshops and things like that. So I pulled them all together and um, turns out that none of them were making a living at it except for two of us. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, Oh, okay, well I pulled this together because I called it a humanitarian fundraising collective because I wanted the head wrappers to give a percentage of their income to um, build an orphanage in Africa. It doesn't really cost that much. Mm -hmm. But what I found out is that these people were doing head wrapping for cultural reasons and just for the love of the art, but they hadn't actually figured out how to make a living at it. So that's when I I decided that I would back away from the group a little bit Mm -hmm. to uh, give myself a chance to develop uh, online classes. I was teaching workshops to people who would come and, you know, face to face and work with me, but it wasn't helping people across the country. So the, So I started developing these online classes using Zoom like this, Mm -hmm. which is nice because, you know, we can practice the styles together and also classes for teaching general vending for people who have their own brand and their own products that they want to sell in the way, in the style that we do the head wrapping using a turnkey method that I tell you, it works like magic. It's, um, I worked this out with, um, you know, with a real uh, social psychologist with that kind of an attitude. Okay. Um, how do people respond? And we find that uh, if you stop and think about how you think shoppers will respond, you're probably wrong, mm-hmm. especially if you're an American because your model is a store model. True. So we just experimented, experimented in different marketplaces and compared notes. And when I say we, I'm talking about me and the different people that worked for me my assistants, to find out what inflection of the voice, what hand motions, how do you hold your body, do's and don'ts. And we discovered that um, there's a lot of do's and don'ts, and that's probably the, that's the crux of the newsletter. It's uh, things that vendors should never do and always say. Very good. So that's mm-hmm. at spiritartsacademy.com, correct? Right. right. In Spirit Arts Academy. Dot com. Dot com. And mm-hmm. I'll make sure I post that in our newsletter as well on with insights so people can know where to well, go. Also, I'd like you to post a link to the event, right? We've got um, classes coming up and your link is tinyurl.com slash vending with Iggy, right? Vending with Iggy. That's right. Vending with Iggy. So we'd like people to use that link because that's part of your own fundraiser. Right, that will be in the class sections of IggyGarcia.com for those of you who are interested. Right. So, so vendor, what, vendor, vendor education, head wrap business, and free trade stores, right? We, oh, not free trade, fair trade. trade. The fair trade. Right. Fair trade is, um, yeah, people often call it free trade because free trade must be something else. And thank you for correcting me. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, I have to do that. That's good. (laughs) I wouldn't want people to get the wrong information. There's a free trade where? (laughs) Yeah, really? I like free things, you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anyways, fair trade is even better. Fair Mm -hmm. trade is, um, well, actually, I've been doing fair trade before fair trade was even coined as a term. Mm -hmm. And fair trade uh, has a lot of different uh, connotations, and people define it differently. Um, and what one organization might say is 
bona fide fair trade, another organization might say, isn't. And there are fair trade federations and there are fair trade organizations. And I tend to stay away from them. Um, and like I said, we've been doing fair trade long before they even came up with the concept. So uh, fair trade, in some, uh, I think if I could say the major tenant is that the products are made by people who are actually making a living, getting a fair wage for their work, mm-hmm. for the handicrafts. They're not working in um, sweatshops or being underpaid. They're getting paid what they ask for. And the type of fair trade I tend to uh, gravitate towards is fair trade where people work together as families or co-ops. And therefore, they cut down their expenses because maybe one person from the co-op will carry the products of many people to the market instead of everybody working individually. Awesome. And also it makes it so it frees up their time so they have more time to do other things. Awesome. So collaboration is the way to go. So and some people might be more interested in the selling aspect, some people more interested in the making aspect. Another thing about fair trade, what we used to do in Africa, is raising money for causes. So using the crafts to raise money for causes that we care about. And uh, in Africa, it was children's causes, um, paying for school fees, and paying for um, educational expenses, because uh, I just said that. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's two ways of saying the same thing. Sorry, I meant hospital fees and educational expenses. So awesome. these are different groups that I worked in. So that's another form of fair trade, is using the crafts and as part of a community development. Some people use um, proceeds for, um, like the people I work with now, sometimes they use the proceeds for, fixing the roofs in uh, school buildings and fixing roads and different uh, infrastructural problems they have in the rural areas. That's pretty awesome. Though. So this all came from just your vision of head wrapping, being able to support these, uh, these communities in Africa. Well, you know, it seems like almost everything in my life has geared me towards this. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. The different experiences that I've had in business, I've been self-employed since I was like, Oops, I can't see how old I was in 1982. Because <laughs> somebody might do the math. <laughs> but I've been so... <laughs> I was a music teacher, and I am a teacher at heart. Very and good. so whenever I go, I, I sort of <clears throat> thrust myself into that role, being a teacher. And um, little did I know that I was developing this lifestyle that people craved. In fact, one of my friends, uh, his name is Antonio, he's like, Oh, Nebsita. He calls me Nebsita because he's Puerto Rican. Even though I'm not that small, but he calls me Nebsita. He's oh, you live like the rich and famous. What are you talking about, you know? (laughs) He says, you only work on weekends. Sometimes you only work one day a week, you know? In fact, when you're working, you have so much fun. We can say it's not work at all. You know, it's true. I have a lot of fun out there, you know, styling head wraps on people. The day goes very, very quickly. Wow. Nepsita, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> as Latinos, we kind of change things, don't we? Like, yeah. uh, like things a little different. Yeah. So I, um, so I discovered, and so as I was vending, I was busy, you know, doing a lot of traveling because I wanted to see the world. I was going to Brazil and different mm-hmm. places to bring products in, and uh, country and other vendors would just ask me things like, "What are you doing?" I mean. The, there are people in your booth, people are laughing, I get people crying, they're screaming, there's all this emotion, there's this huge upheaval. What are you doing to make people respond that way Mm -hmm. to your products? And one lady walked up to me and she said, hey, you know, your jewelry is nice, but my jewelry is better. She goes, your prices are okay, but so are mine. I mean, what is it? I mean, when I look at your booth, it's not that great compared to mine. I mean, it's true. Her, her display was much better, to tell you the truth, because she puts a lot of emphasis in the display. I put a lot of emphasis on the interaction with the people. True. And so over the years, um, vendors were constantly asking me, what am I doing? What is the secret? And, what are, and so I said, well, one of these days, you know, when I slow down, I'm going to teach it. So that, that day has come. <laughs> you know, I've I've gone to shows and expos and different things, and sometimes the displays are very intimidating. I've been to, uh, yeah, I've been, to, I've seen some. They just kind of steer me away, you know, kind of like 
it's really pretty stuff, but you already know walking in there that you're going to be paying a pretty penny. And yeah, so, and the, or they seem to be saying, "Don't touch, don't touch." Yeah, don't touch. If you break something, yeah, yeah, you, you own it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, don't bring your kids in here. When I, well, yeah. we're a very touchy feely booth, and it's a very messy booth because mm-hmm. we encourage people to dig in and throw things around. And um, like I said, there's a lot of like I say the the tricks of the trade. Um, most of the time, when I tell somebody one of the tricks of the trade, they go. Oh, that makes sense. But they never thought about it themselves because they've got this store meth model in their brain. Mm-hmm. Right? right? And um right, so there you go. So I would like people to definitely I'm mm-hmm. um, being involved. So the main thing about uh in spirit arts is a very humanitarian uh has a always a strong humanitarian emphasis. And I'm very happy because I've come up with some awesome ideas. <clears throat> for what we call leveling the privileged field. You've heard that expression, leveling the playing field? Yeah, I've heard that expression, correct. Well, we have a hashtag, leveling the privileged field. Hmm. And the reason why uh, I developed these different programs is because when I started the group on Facebook, thousands of people were drawn to the idea of head wrapping and vending, people that want to be free in life, they only want to work a couple of days a week, um, they need a cash cow, something that can pay all their bills mm-hmm. and not take up all their time. So it's really, really important for creative people, like those artisans I started out with. Mm-hmm. I would always in Africa, I always say, you know, you want to have a product that you can churn out, you know, with hardly any effort. Something that's only going to use a small corner of your brain, and you just churn that out as your cash cow and sell it over and over and over and over again, so that most of the week you're free developing your masterpieces. And so I believe that's true for people in general. Your work should be something you can just, you know, your money making or your income activity, something you can just churn out sure. so you can spend the rest of the week developing your life masterpiece. It takes a lifetime. Like what I'm offering now, it's taken a whole lifetime for me to be able to do this, to be able to, to learn it at that level, to be able to communicate to other people how to basically imitate my success. So um, where was I? Backing up a little bit. I'm getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> I might want to get in the head wrap business here. I don't know. Well, definitely it would be, oh, yeah. So I offer organizations the opportunity to train like the, a team of head wrappers to raise money for the organization mm-hmm. and pay the volunteers. Well, they're not really volunteers because you're paying them. Right. Okay. So, but it's creating sort of what I call a, I don't just call it, it's a social enterprise. Basically a social enterprise is like a nonprofit that works in a way of a nonprofit that has a soul of a nonprofit, but um, makes money and, and shares the money amongst the people who do the work. So that's what a social enterprise is. And that's what I, um, that's my mindset. Mindset is social enterprise and also micro franchising. Instead of people starting from scratch and trying to figure out a business like mine from the beginning, which took forever, it's better to just copy or imitate or duplicate the success or the, the, the structure of the business that's already there. We call it business in a box. You know, right, it's right. already contained. All you have to do is work it. And that was a very important concept in Africa, too, because um, people there can't afford to the risk of losing. If they invest in a business, that business better work because people don't necessarily, uh, you know, they can't necessarily afford to fail and fail again and fail better as we do here in privileged countries. You know, one good failure in Africa could put you out on the street. Yeah, I can, that's in Peru, too, the same way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So um, what I was saying, that leveling the privilege field is um, after, after having that experience in the, our first humanitarian fundraising collective on Facebook, I realized that there's a lot of people who wanted to get involved but just couldn't come up with the money to buy a business startup package mm-hmm. or to pay for the training. So I donated a lot of trainings and I donated a lot of um, business startup packages, but that's not a viable business. 
um, but it was good to help some people get off the ground. But um, I can't give away too much because they're not, it's not, the products aren't even really mine. They belong to co-ops. So, um, so what we decided to do is create affiliate programs. Hold on, let me get a little drink of water. Sure, sure. Well, we hope you're enjoying our interview here with Miss Nebsa as she's taken us on a tour of her, her life and the rapping movement, as we call it, uh, Rap Our World. So I'm pretty excited to have you on tonight. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, the Wrap Our World movement is also part of the leveling the privilege field. And we have different like raffles and different ways that people can get involved in the head wrapping or involved in vending their own products, not just head wrapping, sure. but whatever they want to vend. Um, mostly hair, fashion, beauty, those kinds of products is, are work well with that. Um, mm-hmm. But to get people started in their business, without having all the startup capital all at once. So. so let me ask you a question. Do you feel that anybody can market anything with your, with the plan that you have this, the system that you have put together or is this specific to a certain type of uh, product? Well, I don't really know at this stage. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that the turnkey methods mm-hmm. are used for uh, very well for hair, fashion, body products, um, wellness products. Um, the method, the head wrap vendor method is all around demonstrating. Sure. So if it's a product that can be demonstrated, it's all about teaching because we don't actually sell. We okay. teach people. We give them a lot of value. We don't, I don't teach people how to close the deal and how to manipulate your customers and all that. We, I, I don't know how to do that. I don't teach that at all. People don't like being sold to. People, you can That's tell right. them somebody's manipulating. So all we do is we lavish our our customers or we lavish shoppers with uh, how to's, how to do this, how to tie your hair scarf, you know, what's Mm -hmm. the best way to put on a headband. It's very touchy feely, very hands on. We touch people's bodies, you know, we connect with them and we engage, right? We, um, we do a lot of service. Like if I was selling earrings, I would literally hold the earring up for the lady. And I call it the princess effect because people feel really good when somebody else is doting on them like that. Sure. So, yeah. So that's one of our also slogans is learn to make people feel good about themselves when they shop with you. So most of the people, when they leave our booth, their energy is much higher. They're much happier than they were when they came. Now I know you have some classes coming up here in the spring. So Number one, you would suggest that someone sign up to your, your free newsletter so they can keep in contact with you. So which, which courses would you recommend that somebody take first in this particular uh, program? Well, you, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to people and figuring that out with them. Um, the, the general vendor class is good for no matter what it is you're selling, mm-hmm. right? So um, if if all of the tips and tricks of the trade aren't applicable to your business, I can be pretty sure that most of them or many of them are because it's just about vending, right? Um, the head wrap, so we have the two classes. One is the general vendor class and the other one is the head wrapping business class. Okay. So the head wrapping business class is really good for people who have like salons or they already are selling a product and they want the head wrapping to draw more customers in because head wrapping is a people magnet. Sure. So they start, they, or maybe they just realize, Oh, their business isn't getting enough attention. So they add that on or they feel that maybe their business is getting okay attention, but they're not really contributing to developing countries. They want to sell hand woven fair trade crafts to make them feel good about what they're doing. It's a, there's a whole different feeling um, selling widgets, for example, mass-produced mm-hmm. products, and selling a handmade products that actually saves people's lives. And when I say saves people's lives, I mean literally. It's a difference between, oh, Maria now has enough calories or not, can afford to purchase enough food to provide enough calories for her children in a day. Mm-hmm. Whereas... Without this little business, she wouldn't. I see. And it's also very empowering for women because a lot of times in developing countries, the men take all the money. Oh, okay. So, yeah. 
so, or they have all their money, or so women are not so dependent waiting for their husbands to decide what they need or what they don't need. They've got their own money, which is important for, because women tend to put their money towards the children. Okay. So your products actually, when they're made in Africa, they, the majority of your products come from there. Are some made here in the United States as well? or No, none of them are made in the States. None of them are made in Africa. I'm not doing Africa right now. We're going to bring back the African line. But okay. uh, these are made in Central America. Oh, really? Beautiful. Yeah, these are made in Central America. And um, you can sort of tell by the colors. The colors mm-hmm. are great. When you look on the website, you'll see. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. So we hope you're enjoying our show today. Uh, we're covering a lot of information. I'm trying to get some information. Sneak, sneak it out. But she's pretty good at not sharing those things. <laughs> now you're trying to get, you're trying to get some of the trying to get some chicks out there. of me. <laughs> now, I'll tell you a lot of things. But if you want the tricks, you have to sign up for the newsletter. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I signed date. up. So I'm waiting for my tricks to come in the email. So. But I can't tell you about the um, multicultural aspect of Inspired Arts. Okay, please. Yeah, um, I've always been an international type person. My Mm -hmm. father was an international traveler and I had the great good fortune of being raised in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which um, had international shows. And my elementary school was uh, transformed into the, like a world expo center once a year. So each classroom was decorated like a different country. You could walk into one classroom and, you know, have some delicacies from Pakistan and walk across the hall and you'd be in USSR and go down the street and you'd be in Bangladesh, you know? And uh, this was just a thrill of my life. And I always um, felt it was really important for people to be able to experience different cultures. And um, put a lot, and then Nairobi is a very cosmopolitan city. And I went to a high school and I graduated from the International School of Kenya I think, let me see, there were um, 36 kids in my class that graduated with me, and there were 34 different ethnic groups. That's pretty awesome. There was only two Americans and two Swedish, (laughs) two American, or European Americans and two Swedish. Everybody else was something else, right? Sure, sure. So when I, um, so I walk into the world, when I start a business, my attitude towards that is that, You know, there's so many things that separate people. There's so many things that divide or keep people apart. But there's something that actually unifies all races and all cultures, and that is head wrapping. Hmm. We call it the great unifier of culture. Why? Because no matter who you are, no matter what your skin color is, no matter where you're from, if you go into photo albums of your family, you're going to find one of your ancestors wearing a hair scar. That's, that's true. That's yeah. True. Yeah, I agree. It's true. Every culture has a hair scar, has a head wrap of some sort. I have one and, of yours on. Yeah. And so what's interesting about the hair head wrapping is that when I'm tying scars on people in the marketplace, one of the first things people tell me is, you know, this is my culture too. This is my heritage. Black people seem to think that head wrapping is an African thing only. It's not true. But black Africans have um, elaborated and embellished and preserved the art of head wrapping. Yeah, I give them that. But they didn't start the art of head wrapping. Well, everything started in Africa. <laughs> but, That's true. Um, That's what they say. Somewhere, it all goes back to Africa. Right. But, um, but all, all cultures have something that they consider a traditional hair scarf. So when people come to my booth and I teach them how to tie a wrap, Mm -hmm. they tell me, oh, this is my culture too. It's not, it's like a modern version of what their great, great, great grandmother used to wear. That's pretty awesome. So people identify with it. I call it the primordial head wrapping gene. It gets triggered. (laughs) You know, you put it on, people recognize themselves, right? So obviously Hispanics, you know, it's a big uh, head wrapping culture. Sure. And then Europeans, obviously, are very, head, especially Germans and French, the big head wrapping culture, they tie it differently. Um, but then Asians, oh, and India, obviously, the turban, all that. But I have, I had a lady from Japan walk up to me and tell me that was her culture. And I had to go look it up on the internet. I couldn't believe it, you know. Wow. And lo and behold, there they were. 
So we call that the great, now in spirit arts, the reason why that's important for the business model is because my students are not locked behind what I call the niche fence. In business, they say, what's your niche? Who's your customer base? What do they look like? Is it female? What age? Where they come from? Whatever. But in in spirit arts, there is no niche fence because the head wrap you sell uh, to a middle-aged white woman is, I mean, it's the same as what you've got on your head right now, Iggy. Yeah. The exact same one. I love it. <laughs> it feels good. Right? Yeah, I just feel, I feel kind of empowered with it. I don't know why. I just kind of feel a little more confident with it when I wear it. You know, I hear that all the time. I don't, we, I don't know what that is, but, you know, just. I'm glad yeah. you mentioned that because head wrapping has some, it affects people's self-esteem. Mm-hmm. And we notice that we, we, you put it on a, a low self-esteem teenager and <clears throat> suddenly her back will get a little straighter and her chin will come up a little higher. And, you know, we talk about it all the times in our group, how putting a scarf on your head just transforms your, your like you said, it makes you feel more confident, more mm-hmm. empowered. I don't know why, but everybody recognizes that. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why we make our customers feel good. They feel good about shopping with us because they walk off feeling, well, one thing, you put color around your face and you look better. (laughs) Let's just face it. (laughs) I kind of feel like a pirate sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) You know me. (laughs) <laughs> but one thing I want to emphasize about the head wrap vendor method and the methods that I teach is that we, we tested them out on a, a lot of different people. Mm-hmm. And um, I intentionally went out and trained people that were not your likely suspects for vending. I would test it out on, um, I had a test on the guy who was schizophrenic and he shaked or he really? shook his hands, trembled all the time. Never stop. Uh, he had kind of a speech impediment. Mm-hmm. He could do it. I tested out on this uh, morbidly obese, super huge black man who just towered over people, and his fingers were like three times the size of mine. He was just a huge guy. Um, he could do it. You know, he just leaned over over his belly, and he could do it. And that's because the method focuses so much on the shopper and not the person doing it. Another lady, she had um, severe um, social anxiety. So you might think, why would you want to be a vendor if you have social anxiety? Because you're just thrown out there in the midst of the public every week. She could do it because she just, we teach people how to use their eyes in a way that's not intimidating and um, so that you can um, function and deal with thousands of people a day, right? Sure. So... Um, it's something that frees people up so that they can do what they really came on the planet to do. And I believe that people are here to help each other. I believe that too. Right. But if you're busy working a job that you've only got a very small, maybe responsibility within a large organization, you might not be able to express your true purpose. So that's why vending is important. And also vending is very important for raising money for good causes. Because organizations might have somebody in their, people that are underemployed in their organization that need the money. And gone are the days, like we've all done it. We've all gotten very excited about a cause and threw our lives into it and worked, 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 and then turned around and said, wait a minute. Uh, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills if I keep working like this. That's, yeah. that's very true. <laughs> yeah. So in spirit arts is, is all about social enterprise so that you get compensated for your work. And it also benefits your organization at large. Very good. So this is probably maybe a good question to ask is this is a self-paced um, learning technique or is this, is this a time constraint? Yeah. Well, Yes and no. The classes are not self-paced because you are given assignments, especially the head wrap vendor method. Mm -hmm. It's all about practicing the styles. You have to go out and practice. You can allow yourself to fall behind because all the classes, we have a $20 a month uh, membership. So um, you can, and in the membership site, you have access to me and you know can ask any questions and I have a lot of information and videos in there. So you can 
you know, do some things at a self pace mm-hmm. month after month after month, or like your, your continual learning, you can do it at self pace, but the classes are better if you stick with the program. So right. you do your, your coaching is also a distance learning as well, right? You know That's how- it. It's done online on zoom, just like this. Mm-hmm. So with the classroom, you're able to see the faces and interact with all the other people in the class. So right? it's like training. Right. So their classes are two hours um, and they're broken. The, each term is uh, three months. And so each class is broken down into three parts. So, and we do that because people sometimes cannot do all three months at the same time. Mm-hmm. They might do the first month, which is part one, and then they might take a break and then come back for part three and then catch up part two some other time. Of course, we give massive discounts if you do the whole quarter all at once. That can be better for some okay. people. But for some people, it might just be too much. Because I have to tell you, I overteach. Oh, okay. I give a lot, a lot, a lot of information. And that's why I store it in the, in the back office in the secret group so that, or the private group so that uh, you can go back and access it later. So would you say that this course is for anybody or? or? Absolutely anybody. Okay. Absolutely anybody. I like working with young people. Mm-hmm. Um, we're starting a, a youth entrepreneurial club this summer and uh, young people can do it. When I say young, even as young as six years old. Okay. Okay. Like they're not tall enough to do the head wrapping, mm-hmm. but the other parts of the method, because it's a script. You know, okay. you just learn this. It's really acting. And I help people to find their role, which role that they feel most comfortable. And they choose that role. And sometimes you switch roles in the middle, you know. But um, it's, it's pretty much acting. Because it's not so much about the seller. As I said, it's all about the customer and helping that customer find the products and choose. Like we have ways of getting people to start choosing products long before they've even decided they want to buy a product, you know? Very They're good. already in the choosing mode, you know? And you can learn all that from the newsletter. It's Very called good. Tips and Tricks. Sounds good. Excellent. So the newsletter gives a lot of information, but it's drawn out in little chunks week by week by week. So you could just, like, get the same information uh, if you have a whole year to you know, do mm-hmm. week by week. But most people just want to get in there and get their business started. Okay. And so that's why the coaching groups are, they're coaching groups. That's why they're, um, I don't know why, I shouldn't really call it a class, but it's a coaching group. Okay. Right. Very good. Well, I appreciate you sharing with us your insights on with Insights Radio about um, what you're doing here and um, give us some places where we can find you and how we can direct to you getting a hold of you. I know through my website, there'll be a link as well. And I'll share that with everybody. But um, in spirit okay. I believe that's what you were saying is your name. In spirit or um It's, you know, the expression in the spirit. Sure. Absolutely. Well, it's not that <laughs> it's in spirit, in spirit. You leave out the, the. in spirit arts with an S at the end. Academy. Very good. Dot com. And uh, that's where you can uh, sign up for the newsletter and look at the different classes. Better hurry. And also we do um, different, what I call it, their uh, question and answer meetings that you can log in and uh, in a similar format as this and ask me questions and tell me what your business ideas are. Sort of like a group coaching, a group consultation. Sure. Tell me what your business ideas are and pick my brains, and I'll help you in every way that I can. Very good. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thanks. And, um, you know, it's exciting. I'm excited. I'm, I'm more intrigued and more curious the more I'm, I'm digging into this and doing the research. Um, so if you're looking for vendor education, head wrap business of some sort, and you wanted to work with fair trade stores, or, you know, this is the place to come, guys. Um, I highly recommend check it out. I mean, you've spent more, you spent more money on dumb things, you know, like, this, <laughs> you know, so yeah. this, is, this is a university, this is an academy in education. So I highly recommend that you check it out. And uh, with that, I want to say thank you. 
Well, there's one more thing I want to mention. Absolutely, go ahead. And there's one, you just touched on something. You said uh, about wasting money. It's also about making money. Uh, um, yeah. I, I, I went to school. I did a lot of business classes and degrees and all that. And it was one thing I always ask my students in uh, sorry, I talked to my students, they all agree that even in one day with me, they get more money-making skills than a four-year degree. I mean, hardcore money-making skills. You can drop me off anywhere, and I'm going to start making money the very next day. Beautiful. Right? Hardcore well, uh, yeah, money-making absolutely. skills than you would <laughs> get in a university. And, uh, and when you think of it that way, it's really, really inexpensive. And on top of it, one other thing that I don't know if I mentioned is our affiliate in Spirit Arts. The way that we level the privilege field is by allowing people to create their own personal fundraisers. You can do it for yourself. You can create a fundraiser for your family. You can create a fundraiser to fix your car or to wow. finance your vacation. There's no excuse then for what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. There's no excuse for being broke is what you're saying and investing yeah. in yourself. No, you're right. There's no excuse. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Iggy. You know, oh, I have you're to welcome. Say, you know, I really like um, being around you. You're, you're a very cheerful person. Oh, thank and, you. Um, thank you for noticing that. <laughs> very positive energy. And uh, that's always a good thing to put out in the world. So it's no uh, mystery why you and I, gravitate towards each other because sure. I think we're sort of on the same mission just to see what good we can do for the world. Well, I know one thing that I'm going to be taking some of your classes here because I'm really intrigued. I want to learn and you know, you can never, never stop learning and especially in the work that I do, you know, you can apply certain things to certain things. So and cross apply. So I'm excited. You got my uh, curiosity going since I couldn't get any secret nuggets out of you. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's kind of the way it is sometimes. You have to, you can't give away the whole thing. But um, thank you. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And so with that, have a great day, folks. We'll talk to you guys next week on withinsightsradio.com. I'm Iggy Garcia, your host from Iggy Garcia Live. Talk to you soon, iggygarcia.com, and we'll see you.